Please be seated. The record will show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and defendant. The witness is retaking the witness stand. Yes, sir. And you can begin your cross-examination. I have it. I have it. I have it. Thank you, Judge. You mentioned that you had just started as a detective when you got this call. Is that right? Yes. I think you said you had not yet gone to detective school. Is that correct? That's correct. What is detective school? Um, detective school for me was a... Uh, 40-hour course that was hosted uh, by uh, outside agency. Um, it was in Las Vegas. And so since this case, or since this call came in, you have since gone to detective school, correct? Correct. But when this call first came in, you hadn't gone, right? That's correct. You also stated that you participated in every search warrant that was done on this case. Is that correct? To my knowledge, yes. Do you know how many searches were done of this property? I would have to refresh my memory with the reports. You had the nighttime search, right? That's the first one, right? right. And then you had another search the following day, correct? Right. And Well, it's actually the same day, right. but it's in the daytime, right. right? And then during that second search, that's when the weapon was located, right? Yes. And during the second search was also when there was metal detection happening, is that correct? Correct. And there was another time when you went to the property um, to collect a tree branch, is that right? Correct. Okay. And so there's at least three different searches of the property that you participated in, right? Yes. The tree branch search, when was that? Do you recall? I don't. Was it in August of 2023? Does that sound about right? Yes. Okay. Any reason why nobody collected this tree during one of the first searches of the property? I don't know. And you were aware that Detective Bunting had located this tree on that first daytime search of the property, correct? Yes, that's correct. But at that time, nobody thought to collect it or analyze it, right? Well, I, I can only speak on myself. And, and at that time, based on the training and the experience I had as a detective, I did not think of doing that. And nobody else did either, correct? I don't know. Well, the tree was still there in August of 2023, right? That's correct. And so at that time, somebody had the idea to go collect this tree, right? Right. Okay. When you were out there on the second search, so the first time you're there in the daytime, did you stand out where the body was located? Yes, ma'am. And did somebody photograph you standing there? Yes, ma'am. And Judge, it's already been admitted. I just want to show the witness and the jury the photograph I have up here. You'll see it eventually. Okay. Is that the photograph that somebody took of you? Yes, ma'am. And you say in this photograph you were standing where the body was located, correct? Correct. And you were aware that the body was located immediately behind a tree, is that right? That's correct. And yet in this photograph, I see you, but I don't see the tree. Right, because the area where the body was located was still considered a crime scene. I did not want to contaminate the area, so I stood near it, but not on top of the immediate area. Okay, so you're not actually standing in the location where the body was located, correct? correct. You're standing maybe a foot or two off to the side, That's right? Correct. Yep. And so that explains why there's no tree concealing you in this photograph, right? Correct. And I can barely see you here. You're just that little dot right there. But if you were to move over to what would be our right when we're looking at the photograph, would that put you where the body actually was located? Based on this picture, I, I, I don't remember if it was to the right or to the left of me. Okay. Were you wearing, you were wearing a black shirt here, correct? Correct. What color pants were you wearing? Tan. And I can see in this photograph, you can pretty clearly see your black shirt, right? Yes. 
but the tan pants kind of blend in with the grass that's there on the ground, right? Well, I can see my full body right there standing. Can you, but the pants are obviously a similar color to the grass that you're standing in, right? They're similar. And you recall that the victim in this case was wearing tan pants, right? Correct. And he was wearing a camouflage shirt, correct? correct. And he had like a gray sort of jacket over that camouflage shirt, correct? Correct. And he was wearing a camouflage backpack over the top of that gray jacket, right? Yes. And so you would agree that this picture doesn't, and it's not meant to, obviously, but it doesn't recreate what the victim might have looked like from this position, correct? It doesn't recreate it. And in order to recreate it, you would have to put on camouflage shirt, camouflage backpack, correct? Correct. And then you'd have to stand off to the side where the victim actually was, right? Right. And that would probably make you much harder to see, correct? I don't know. Camouflage is designed to make you harder to see, right? Sure. That's the purpose of camouflage, right? Well, I don't know what the purpose of camouflage is. I know it's a clothing item of color, but as far as its purpose, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Well, it's generally used to camouflage things, obviously, right? Well, was that a statement? It's a question. I don't know how to answer that question. All right. This photograph is taken from the patio, correct? Yes. And more or less, very general, but more or less kind of the area where these shell casings are located, correct? That's correct. And this photograph shows all of the obstacles that are in between the person who's taking the photographs and further out to that area where you're standing, right? Well, I wouldn't describe it as an obstacle. I would describe it as a scenery. So when I say obstacles, for example, I mean trees, okay, right? Sure. A lot of trees out there. Okay. There's that smoker kind of in the middle of the picture, right? Yes. That, that big metal thing? Yes. And then there's the Ramada right there, right? Right. And that's got a concrete table in it, correct? That's correct. And that prickly pear right there, right? Yes. And also those things next to the smoker, correct? Right. So it's a pretty... Pretty difficult and pretty long way to be looking out there from there, right? Correct. You were also inside the house at some point, or at a couple of different points, is that right? That's correct. And you were inside the house on one of these searches in the daytime, correct? That's correct. And would it be at the same time approximately that this photograph was taken? Or on that same search, I should say? Yes. Okay. And so the sun is out, right? So there's plenty of light and you can see, correct? Yes. From inside the house, did you ever look out the windows inside of the house to this same location where you're standing? I did not. Do you know if anybody did that? Mm, I, don't, I don't know, not to my knowledge. Do you know if from inside the house you can even see that area where you're standing? I personally didn't do it. You didn't look to test it out? I didn't. Do you, and you don't know if anybody else did that either? To my, I, I don't know. And to get a good idea of the line of visibility, it would be a good idea to have someone standing where you're standing in this photograph, right? And to have somebody else go inside the house and look out the windows, correct? Can you rephrase sure. that question? Sure. If you were standing right where you're standing in this photograph, and if somebody else went inside the house and maybe looked out the windows, they could tell whether or not they could see you, correct? Sure. And that would be useful information to have in this case, right? Yes. Thank you. Let me, we can take that down, Valeria. Thank you. You had an interview with um, Mr. Kelly, is that right? I assisted in the interview, yes. You were present during an interview with Mr. Kelly, right? Yes. yes. And Detective Einsa was there as well, correct? Correct. And this is on the evening of January 30th, is that right? Yes. So this is shortly after this report has come in, correct? Correct. And you, you hadn't gone out to the scene prior to doing this interview, had you? No. So you, you don't go out until later, right? That's correct. And is the same true for Detective Einsa, if you know? I believe so. 
Okay. And your job during this interview was to just collect some information from Mr. Kelly, correct? Correct. And you also, and you did that, right? You and Detective Einsa did this interview, correct? Correct. At some point after that interview, did you contact the medical examiner? I would have to refresh my memory on the report. You stated earlier in your testimony that you attended an autopsy. Is that right? That's correct. And that autopsy took place after you had done the interview with Mr. Kelly. Is that correct? That's correct. And before that autopsy took place, or during, or at any time in this case, did you have any communication with the medical examiner? Again, I would have to refer my recollection to the report. And I'm going to show you, and it's already been admitted as well. So if Valeria, you could just pop this up on the screen. I'm just going to show you a page from the medical examiner's report. This is uh, Defense Exhibit AAA, I believe. And if you could look, do you see that upper portion that says investigator narrative? Yes, ma'am. And I know the letters are really small, <laughs> but can you go ahead and read that and let me know if that refreshes your recollection? Yes. So does that refresh your recollection about some communication that you had with the medical examiner? Correct. And just so we're on the same page, it says here, and this is the medical examiner's report, correct? Yes. yes. So you didn't write this, right? No. But she wrote this down. And what she wrote was, the homeowner indicated that the group was running parallel to the property and had long rifles on their possession. He then allegedly pursued the group and engaged them, firing one shot from his AK-47 rifle. Do you see that sentence there? Yes, ma'am. And she also says that at the very bottom, sort of the last sentence was, information was obtained via telephonic interview with Deputy Barba, right? That's correct. So that's you, obviously, yes. right? Yes. So you told the medical examiner that the homeowner pursued a group and engaged them. Is that right? Again, I don't remember my, my conversation with the OME that night. I would have to refer to my personal report, not the investigator's report. However, if, she's, if this is what she's documenting, then I would consider it to be correct. Well, that is what she's documenting. <laughs> is that a question? Sorry. <laughs> we had a sidebar there for just a moment. Apologies. So this is what she's documenting, and she also documents that after he had pursued the group and engaged them, he fired one shot from his AK-47 rifle. Do you see where that's documented? Yes. And she's getting that from you, right? Right. So you must have said something along those lines to her, correct? I believe so. And that would be after you had done this interview with Mr. Kelly, correct? I don't remember if it was before or after. You don't remember if you interviewed Mr. Kelly first or if you contacted the medical examiner first? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. If you had interviewed Mr. Kelly first, then you would have the information that Mr. Kelly gave you in the interview, right? Yes. And then you could pass that information on to the medical examiner, right? Correct. Otherwise, where would you get your information? So if you had not interviewed Mr. Kelly prior to contacting the medical examiner, where would this information come from? Uh, I believe this information was really to me by the officers who were on scene. So you might have heard this from officers on scene, or you might have heard this from Mr. Kelly. You're not sure? Correct. And you agree that after you interviewed Mr. Kelly anyway, 
it's clear that this information is not correct. Is that right? Or not in totality? Not in totality. Tell yeah. me what that means. Um, well, some of this information is the information that was really um, to us that Mr. Kelly was reporting whenever he contacted Border Patrol. So tell me which part's not correct. How about the part where he pursued the group? That's not correct, is it? Well, there's footage of Mr. Kelly down his ranch after he was reported so. You're saying there's footage of Mr. Kelly pursuing a group? Well, I wouldn't say pursuing, but he's seen down the ranch after he reported that the migrants were on his property. And he's seen walking, correct? I haven't seen the footage myself. Again, this is all information that was really to me. Okay, so you haven't seen this, but it's fair to say that it's not correct based on the interview that you did with Mr. Kelly or that you assisted in. It would not be correct to say that he pursued the group. Objection, this Your Honor. Calls for hearsay. He was present during the interview. He knows what Mr. Kelly said during the interview. And Your Honor, this is the subject of a prior motion, unless the state offers it. It's not going for the truth of the matter asserted. It's going to show that detectives are passing on incorrect information to other individuals. Overruled. So the narrative that's documented right here was the information that was provided to me. So this didn't come from interviewing Mr. Kelly? I, I believe it was a combination of, of everything. But again, I, I would have to refer to my reports to clarify. And we'll talk about the interview in just a minute so you can refer to that, if that would help. But it's fair to say that Mr. Kelly never stated that he was pursuing anybody when he was being interviewed by you folks. Is that correct? Correct. And certainly there was no statement made about him firing one shot from his AK-47 rifle, correct? Again, I would have to refer to the Same interview. objection, Your Honor. And it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. It's being offered to show that detectives obtain one piece of information in an interview and then they pass on an incorrect piece of information. I'm going to sustain the objection. All right. You also stated that you did some, and Valeria, we can take that down. Thanks. You also stated that you did some gunshot residue testing. Is that correct? And that was from the jacket and the shirt. Is that right? And just to clarify, I didn't do the test. I just you collected, collected it. Okay. You collected this, and I think you had, was it Aaron Brudnell who was assisting you with that collection? Yes, ma'am. And he was showing you how to do that collection, right? Correct. Because you hadn't done one of those before? That's correct. And that involved, that was late of June 2023. Is that correct? Yes. So you're taking swabs at that time of the clothing, correct? Correct. Do you have any idea why, why you were doing that in late June of 2023? I don't. You don't know why it took so long to accomplish that testing? Well, DPS originally had denied um, testing for gunshot residue. So then uh, the county attorneys was tasked to locate an outside agency that would do the testing for us. And so just finding somebody to do it might have accounted for the delay? I believe so. When you tested this clothing, just explain to me how the clothing that you tested was packaged. It was packaged in uh, brown paper bags. And the shirt and the jacket were packaged that way? Individually, yes. Okay. What about the backpack? What about the backpack? Was the backpack, the backpack was not tested in this way, is that correct? No, ma'am. Do you have any idea why the backpack was not tested for anything like gunshot residue? Yes, yeah, so I only had a limited amount of vials. Um, the kit came with six vials. One of the vials was broken during transport, left me with uh, five vials. I used one of those five vials as the collection blank just to make sure that there was nothing in the air that could contaminate what I was about to be testing, leaving me with four vials. With those four vials, then I 
got the clothing of Gabriel the victim because I believe those were the items that were more exposed if uh, if we were to collect GSR gunshot residue. And you you swabbed the jacket individually, correct? Yes. And is that on a what's the swab look like? Just describe that for me. So they're they're small vials, and they have a top that's um. I don't know the exact term for it, but I'll call it a stump for lack of a better term. It's a, a flat surface, surface that's uh, metal-like. And um, so I uncover the, the top from the vial, the glass vial, and then um, I proceed to just tap the area. And you did that with each piece of clothing, correct? With the jacket, with the shirt, and with the, um, the pants, yes. Okay. And then did you put them into separate vials, each of those samples? Or they went back to the vial that I uncovered it. So the sample from the shirt, the sample from the jacket, and the sample from the pants, they all went into the same vial? Correct. And then the reason you're saying you don't test a backpack is because you didn't have any more vials? I didn't have enough vials. That's correct. But I thought you said you had four vials. Yes. So the jacket was the bigger um, piece of clothing, so I used two vials with that jacket, and that's what the um, victim was wearing, the most exterior portion of his clothing. So I did one vial for the front portion of it. I did another vial for the back portion of the jacket. All right. That leaves me with two more. I did one vial for the shirt, front and back, and then my <coughs> last vial was for the pants, and I also did um, front and back. You also um, reviewed the phone downloads that were done in this case, correct? Yes, ma'am. And did that involve just looking through different phones? Obviously, you had Mr. Kelly's phone that you reviewed, right? Yes. And you also reviewed the phone of the decedent, correct? That's correct. So and I'm just, just going to say Gabriel. It's easier that way. So okay. you reviewed Gabriel's phone. Is that right? Yes. Did you locate um, pictures in that phone? Yes, ma'am. If I could show you, let's see. May I see them? Yeah, sure. Here are some. Renard, the state's going to object based on relevance. None of these are the dates of the incident. And Judge, these are these are photographs to include pictures uh, of. Let's go, the let's go on the. Let's go on that side. So the objection is uh, overruled in part and sustained in part, and I made a record about that uh, while we're on the headsets. And you can proceed. Can yes. Yes. And is that a photograph from the cell bright that you examined in this case? Correct. So that's from the victim's phone. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And that's a picture of Gabriel, correct? Correct. And he's standing up on that high place with his fanny pack, correct? Correct. And he's got binoculars with him, right? Yes. And a radio. Right. right. Oh. It's very small, I know. Yeah. I, I see the binoculars. I don't see the radio. Okay. And then um, could you tell us, based on what you see next to that picture, what the date is of that photograph? That is January 21st. Right. 2023. Just an objection. Foundation. I'm sure the witness can lay it, but if we could have the foundation for the record. All right. Sustain. If you can lay some more foundation. As part of your review of the cell bright, did you extract data with each photograph that you looked at? Yes, ma'am. And how did you do that? What process was that? Well, the extraction, I didn't do. FBI um, agent assisted me with the extraction. So did he generate that little report that you see on the side of the photograph? Yes, ma'am. And did he inform you that that contained the date and time that things were created? Yes. And if you look at that, could you tell us what the date is of this? Program? And, Your Honor, 
I guess the objection is foundation. I don't think this witness has the foundation. I think that might have been Agent Douglas. All right, I'll, I'll overrule that, and he can testify. The date is January 21st, 2023. And so that's how many days before the event? Uh, nine. I'm not doing arithmetic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's close in time to the event, right? It's about weeks. And does it appear that he's wearing similar or the same clothing as when he was later discovered on January 30th? Yes. All right, move to admit the exhibit. Oh, sorry. What was that again? Was that uh, triple I, I, I. triple I? Objections have been noted. Any other? If there's no other objection? No other objections. Right, the objections Thank are you, noted, Robert. and the objections overruled, and exhibit triple I is admitted. Permission Granted. And Your Honor, could we um, could we blank the screen for a minute and have a side conversation? Okay. Can I go ahead and pull this up? It was so small. I just want to, I came up here to do this, and I'll be careful what. Sure. Sounds good. I'll just move on while they're doing that. <clears throat> did you, when you reviewed that photograph, first of all, did you notice anything about that picture that stood out to you? No. You didn't notice that he was wearing the same clothes as the date that he was discovered? Um, well, I don't know if it's the same exact clothes. They're very similar, right? They're similar, yes. And the fanny pack he's obviously carrying in front of him, right? Correct. And did you see photographs of the body when it was located in this case? Yes. And did you notice that the fanny pack was off to the side? I don't recall the location, but I do recall he had a, a backpack. He had a backpack and a fanny pack, correct? Right. And do you recall when the body was discovered that this fanny pack was off to the side? It's similar, yes. Meaning it wasn't underneath his body. Is that correct? Again, I, I didn't go to the location of the body whenever it was removed, so I, I couldn't testify on the location of where. Right, so, just, just to be clear, we, we now have a screen and it's being published to the jury, right? Yes. Is that right? It's on your screens? All right, good. I'm sorry, go ahead. And just to be clear on the date, this is January 21st, 2023, of this photograph, correct? Yes, yes ma'am. And then the date that the body is discovered is January 30th of 2023, correct? Right. Just one moment, Judge. Did you review, so was there anything else that you saw in this phone that you thought was relevant to this case? At the completion of my review, I, I believe that I, I printed out the same picture that you, um, that you presented as far as um, others as well. Okay, and so you made a determination that this photograph was important, is that right? Right. Why did you believe this photograph was important? The same reason that you just mentioned, he was wearing similar clothing. Similar clothes on a different date, right? Correct. Did you go through um, text messages that were on this phone as well? Yes. Did, you, did anything stick out to you there? No text messages. No text messages? Not to my knowledge. If I show you your report, would that help refresh your recollection on whether you saw any messages? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and Valeria, could you put that just on the witness's screen? And if you need me to scroll backwards, let me know. I, I just scrolled to the page that's relevant. But just take a look at this when it pops up and let me know if that helps refresh your recollection about that. Yes. 
So did you notice any text messages? No, I just uh, documented them as far as because they were the day of um, the, the incident. But so, uh, it's important to note that the time is in universal code, which is seven hours ahead of local time. And, Your Honor, um, my only objection here is that these are in Spanish. Are Spanish-speaking um, witnesses, are Spanish, non, obviously the jurors cannot rely on their own translation abilities on this. So I'm not sure what counsel's doing with this. I'm just asking about text messages that the victim received on the day of the incident. We'll take it question by question. And, sure. Uh, you can uh, inter, 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 intersperse objections if you have any question by question. And so there are some missed calls on here, correct? Yes. And then if you look down, I guess, third from the bottom, is that a text message that you noticed? Um, third from the bottom, the, the one that said red or sent? Uh, the one that says sent. Yes, that's a text message. Okay. And what does that say? It says, no me ha llegado. Your Honor. And, and that's the issue is the translation. If counsel wanted well, these, we need a translation. And I can ask him what it means, or we could ask the translator to translate it. Well, <laughs> yeah, we can ask the translator to translate it. All right, let's do that. Um, it's a very short. It's just a couple of words. So can you repeat the, uh, the text in the Spanish again? No and, Your Honor, perhaps we could show it to the translator. You need to see it. Okay. All right. Is it on that? Is it on that screen there? No. It's, 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 you want to come it's over? right there, though. No, the other one. On the, it's right on the Elmo in front of her. Oh yeah, it's it's that's right. It's on the. Uh, just give her the exhibit. On the Elmo, isn't it? Oh. Oh, sorry. Oh, I thought right. it was a computer one. My part. Well, just spell it. Just let's just just spell it out. It's spelled N O M E space A Y E G A D O. Thank you. And then there's just one more right above that. Is that right? Yes. And what does that one say? I'll spell it out again. If you read it, and then I'll ask if you. Thank you. Ahí te van a marcar, carnal. Marcar? Yes. And, Your Honor, could we lay some foundation for these text messages as well? If we're going to put in the content, we need the time and who, they're, who the parties are. So, I guess, objection foundation. All right, well, I don't, let's some foundation as to the time okay. of the message, the date and time. So going back to that first if you one, can. This, no me ha llegado, there's a date right there of January 30th, 2023, is that right? Yes. And that says 4, is it 4.35 a.m.? Not local time. So we subtract seven hours from that? Correct. Dare I ask you to subtract seven hours from that? Please don't. <laughs> that's going to put you in the previous day, right? Sorry. And that's when, when it says sent, does that signify that that was something that the owner of this phone sent to somebody? Correct. And just so I'm clear, th these, are, these are text messages that this witness he co reviewed. copied or downloaded yes. from the victim's phone. That yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thanks. And so that no me ha llegado is a message that was sent from this phone to somebody else, correct? Correct. And then the other message I'm asking you about, the date is also January 30th of 2023, correct? Correct. And that says, does that say 9.55 a.m.? Yes. And so then we would subtract Honor, seven. I'm sorry, I don't 19. think that's what it says. It, what does it say? 7 So it'd be just 7 19 a.m., correct? And so then we would subtract seven hours from that, right? Yes. And what, that message is marked as red, right? Correct. So that's something that this person received, right? Correct. And what does that message say? 
Do you want me to translate or? Read it in Spanish and then the translator can translate it. Ahí te van a marcar carnal. They're going to call you, buddy. Thank you. Okay. No other messages on this phone. Is that right? Uh, from the 30th or, or the day um, before or after, no. Okay. So you didn't, you didn't see any messages talking about going to do work in Phoenix, right? No, ma'am. And you didn't see any messages from family members, right? Yes. Mes text messages around the date of the 30th is what I'm asking about. There oh, weren't any of those, right? I don't believe so. We just read the two that were there, right? right? So nobody saying, where are you? Are you okay? Nothing like that, right? Not that I saw. Okay. You mentioned also, just while we're on the topic of phones, you, you took Mrs. Kelly's phone. Is that correct? It was confiscated, yes. That was at the station, correct? Correct. And that was after she and her husband had been brought there to be interviewed, correct? That's correct. Why did you take her phone? Um, there were reports that Ms. Kelly and Mr. Kelly had contact by phone um, during the time that the incident was reported. And then there were additional reports that Mr. Kelly used Ms. Kelly's phone to contact Border Patrol. So since it was used in the commission of the um, incident that we're investigating, we deemed it as evidence. And, um, and that's the reason why it was confiscated. And you seized the phone, right? Correct. She didn't tell you, yes, you can have it, correct? correct. You, just, you just took it, right? Well, we, we explained to her the reason why. Um, I didn't walk in and snatch out of her hand. I, I walked in, she had her phone, and I said that, you know, we were going to have to take her phone for evidence, and she was, it was explained the reason why. And um, essentially, that's what happened. Okay. I want to talk about this interview that you had with the defendant, or I, I keep saying you, I know it was Detective Einza who was doing most of the questioning, correct? Yes. And just describe for me Detective Einza's demeanor in this interview. Professional. Say more about that. What do you mean? Um, well, he was calm and collected. Um, he was very polite with Mr. Kelly. Not once did he uh, um, say a bad word to him or say anything neg negative to him. Um, I guess the, I would just say professional. Did he accuse Mr. Kelly in this interview? I don't believe so. Did he tell Mr. Kelly you shot him in this interview? I would have to refer back to the interview. And if I showed you a transcript of that interview, would that help refresh your recollection? Yeah, I'm going to object again. This is getting into the area we've already discussed in terms of the objection regarding the pretrial ruling. Well, um, I'm not asking about the defendant's uh, statements. We're, we're going to, are we going to see this interview? Is that going to be, is someone, is someone going to offer it? The video of the interview? Eventually, yes, Judge. Right. So, what do you want to ask him? I just want to ask him about Detective Einza's demeanor in the interview and some of the statements that Detective Einza makes to Mr. Kelly in the interview. All right. And your concern is with the defendants. Ms. Hunley, Ms. Hunley your concern is with possible hearsay by uh, admission, questions by the defense directed towards what the defendant said? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Well, let's take it question by question. Ms. Larkin says she's not going to ask questions to that effect. She's just going to ask questions about <laughs> How, what uh, Detective Einza's demeanor was. So you can go forward. Objections overruled, but we'll take it question by question. Thank you. So in this interview, Detective Einza confronts Mr. Kelly. Is that fair to say? Well, he's speaking with them. Say that again? He's speaking with them. When I say confront, I mean he makes statements. For example, you shot him. Do you recall Detective Einza making that statement? Again, I would have to refer my recollection to the... So if we watch this interview, we might or might not see that. You don't remember if that was said? I don't remember. Do you recall Detective Einza telling Mr. Kelly to help himself out? I don't remember. Do you recall Detective Einza telling Mr. Kelly to tell the truth? I don't remember. Do you recall Detective Einza telling Mr. Kelly, if you keep lying, it's going to get worse for you? I don't remember. You don't remember that? 
If that had been said, would that be professional? Again, I, I would prefer not to speculate and answer a question on something that I don't remember. Well, it was just a hypothetical. If and hypothetical, it would be speculating. Hypothetical is, well, would you ask somebody that question in an interview? Would you state to them, if you keep lying, it's going to get worse for you? I would say that telling the truth would be better for them, yes. I'm asking, would you tell them, if you keep lying, it's going to get worse for you? Yes. You would say that in an interview? Yes. And you'd consider that to be okay? Yes. Do you recall Detective Einstein telling Mr. Kelly, we're going to do ballistics, and if that comes back as coming from your rifle, then you're going to be in big trouble? I don't recall. You don't recall that? Part of my preparation for this was not to review other people's interviews, um, supplements, etc. You were there, right? I was, but I didn't document the interview. And did you recall Detective Einza telling Mr. Kelly that Mr. Kelly had already admitted to Border Patrol that he shot somebody? I don't recall. You don't recall that? No. And you don't recall then Detective Einza telling Mr. Kelly, this is all recorded and we know that you made that statement. You don't recall that? I don't recall. Is it common practice in interviews to confront a suspect and say things like that? Depending on the circumstances, it, it, it depends. It's not uncommon to say, you know, you better tell us the truth, right? It's not uncommon. And it's not uncommon to say, we know that you're lying, we have it all recorded or something like that, right? That's correct. Ma and the purpose of doing that in an interview is to try to get a person to come forward and admit to doing something. Is that right? Well, not necessarily. It's going to be a case-by-case -case situation because sometimes you know the truth and the individual is just not telling you the truth. So and let me ask you this. If you know the truth, like let's say you have something that's on video that you saw, you know what's true, but somebody is lying to you about what happened, you can confront them with that video. Is that right? Again, you can. And then they might acknowledge what they did or not. But that's something that can be done in interviews, correct? It can, but it's not always done because you don't want to contaminate the evidence that you have. Sure. And sometimes you might even lie to a person and tell them that you have evidence, right? Yes, ma'am. So you might say to a person if you suspect that they're lying, We've got it all on video. You better just admit to it right now, right? Correct. And sometimes that's enough to get a person to admit to something that they've done, right? Sometimes. And obviously when somebody does that, that tells you that this person was lying to you before, but now they're coming clean and telling you the truth, right? Correct. What does it tell you when you confront somebody like that in an interview, but they push back? Again, it's... A case-to-case -case situation because sometimes it's deceiving, they're trying to hide the truth, and other times they are trying to tell the truth. Well, and so, for example, let's say you're not sure if somebody's telling you the truth. One way to find out is to say, listen, we've got you on video, we can see you doing this, you better just admit to it right now, right? And then you can see how they respond, right? Correct. And so somebody who was lying to you might respond by coming clean and saying, okay, if you have it on video, you got me. This is what I did, right? Mm -hmm. And then somebody who's telling the truth might say something like, I hope you do have it on video because I didn't do that or something like that, right? Right. So if Mr. Kelly was confronted in this interview and told, you know, we're going to do ballistics, it's all recorded, but he continues to push back, that indicates he might be telling the truth, right? No. That does not indicate he might be telling the truth. No, because people, in my experience, who are guilty and have a guilty conscience continue to fight back. It, it, again, it's a case-to-case -case situation. It, it all depends. So you're saying if somebody comes forward and admits to something when you confront them with evidence, that means that they were lying to you and they were guilty, right? Say that one more time. I didn't understand your question. If you confront somebody with evidence okay. and they come forward and change their story and say, you're right, you got me, I did it, that means that they were guilty, right? Well, it's an admission, so yes. Right. And also, if they say, 
No, I didn't. Show me the video. To you, that also could mean they're still guilty, right? No, it, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that they're innocent. It doesn't mean that they're guilty. What I'm saying is that it, it depends. And they could be innocent, just because, right? Just because an individual is saying, I didn't do it, watch the footage, get all the proof that you need, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're innocent. Or get the ballistics, is anything like that? Correct. Doesn't mean that they're innocent, but it's more likely, right? Again, it, it depends on the incident and the evidence presented and the investigation, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of this interview, that's when, was it Detective Einsa who made the decision to arrest Mr. Kelly? I don't have that information. What happened to Mr. Kelly after this interview? He was arrested. Who arrested him? Again, I wasn't part of that, so I don't have that information. You have no idea who arrested Mr. Kelly? All I know is that Mr. Kelly was subsequently um, transported and booked into the adult detention, adult detention facility. By who? Do you know? I believe it might have been um, Sergeant Garcia or Sergeant Pacheco. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't recall. I want to talk a little bit about different witness statements. So you collected a statement, or you were present when Mr. Kelly provided a statement, right? Right. And you were present when Mrs. Kelly provided a statement, right? Initially, I had to step out at the beginning of it. Okay. And you also, did you ever review a statement made by a person named Miguel? Do you know anything about that? No, ma'am. So you don't know what Miguel stated, but were you aware that there was a person named Miguel who had come forward early on in this case? Yes, ma'am. And that's one of the reasons why you spoke with Gabriel's family members, correct? Correct. Because you were trying to determine who this person was or if Gabriel had a relative named Miguel, correct? That's correct. And did you do that? Was it your understanding that you were doing that because this Miguel person claimed that he was related to Gabriel? Yes, ma'am. But then when you talk, talked with the family, it turns out that claim was not true, correct? Right. Okay. Did that ever cause you concern? That he wasn't, that that wasn't real or, or I don't understand the question. So you have somebody who comes forward who claims to be a witness, right? That's Miguel, correct? Correct. And he made a statement to law enforcement that was false, right? Correct. Does that concern you? N not necessarily because this case was highly publicized. So it was expected that we would have individual individuals that would want to take advantage of the, of the case. Say more about that. What do you mean? Well, um, try to make false accusations or that they were there when they weren't really there to try to see if they could get maybe um, some sort of um, green card or, or immunity. So you were concerned that people might be coming forward to make false statements about this case? No, that's the reason why I wasn't concerned that Miguel ended up not being real. Okay. But you just said that there was a thought that people might come forward to take advantage of the situation, right? Well, after it was confirmed that Miguel was not real, um, there was a brainstorm process that occurred, and ultimately at the end of that brainstorm process, we came to that conclusion. Tell me about that process. What happened? Well, we, we spoke about it. I relayed the information that was provided to me back to um, criminal investigations to CID, and um, we, we talked about it, and we determined that that was highly a possibility. So who's we? Who who did you have this conversation with? Um, I, I don't remember who was present, but at the office, it's uh, Sergeant Flores, um, myself, Detective Ainsa. And was this because Miguel came forward, correct? Is yeah. that why you had this conversation? What prompted this conversation? Oh, yeah, because Miguel came forward. And Miguel turns out to be making a false report, right? Correct. That's a crime, isn't it? In the United States, yes. So it's a crime to falsely report something to law enforcement, right? In the United States. And you said that you had some discussion with other detectives and things about this possibility, right? Correct. What did you decide to do to safeguard against possible false reports coming in? I did not have that conversation. 
did anybody talk about, you know, this is a high profile case? Did anybody <clears throat> bring that up as a concern? <clears throat> Not to my knowledge. Did anybody <clears throat> say we better be careful when we're taking statements of people who claim to be witnesses in this case? Well, I believe that in general is just common practice. That's common practice? Right. Whenever we're taking a statement, we, we all just want to make sure we check for credibility. How do you check for credibility when somebody comes forward with a statement? Well, the statement that's being provided to us, if it's relevant, if they have the facts right, if um, anything that they're saying doesn't necessarily add up. I mean, it's a lot of things that come into play. So just to break that down a little bit, do you compare witness statements to other statements that have been made in the case? Yeah, that happens. And do you compare witness statements to physical evidence that you have in the case? Yes. And you compare witness statements to maybe scientific or forensic evidence that you have in the case, right? Yes. And it's good practice to analyze every witness statement in any case. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And especially a homicide, right? Correct. It's very serious, right? When you spoke with, because you actually spoke with two people personally who were claiming to be witnesses, is that correct? Correct. And the first one that you spoke with, was that Ramon or was that Daniel? The first one was Ramon. Okay. Let me get to Ramon. All right. When you spoke with Ramon, what were the circumstances that you you discovered this person was claiming to be a witness? Uh, Ramon was apprehended by Border Patrol, the United States Border Patrol, the Sonoida Station. He had made some comments to one of their agents that he was involved in the group that was shot at. Um, and then they were aware of the incident. They then contacted the sheriff's office, who contacted uh, Sergeant Flores. Um, Sergeant Flores advised us that he was going to head out to Sonora to interview the individual, and um, I went with him. And you did the interview of this individual, is that correct? Correct. And if you need to refresh your recollection, let me know and I can show you a transcript of that interview, okay? Okay. But I just want to ask you a few things. Let me pull that up so I have it. Do we have an exhibit number, Council? Um, sure. How about that? Oh, there it is. This will be, I believe it is Exhibit W. Okay. And this will just be for the witness, Validia. If we need it, we might not. Okay. So how long of a conversation did you have with Ramon? I believe the interview was uh, about 16 minutes. And what, did you have any idea why he was there at the Border Patrol, why Border Patrol had picked him up? Because he was apprehended for crossing illegally into the United States. Did you also say alien smuggling? No. You never, you don't remember saying that he was picked up for alien smuggling? No. Okay. Did he was, you? He was part of a group. Okay, do you recall if he was saying he was helping bring up the rear because he was helping the guide or something like that? Well, that was uh, the day of the incident. When, he, when I asked him to talk about the day of the incident, he told me that his job for Your that Honor, specific day. And I'm going to object to the details of the interview without the whole interview coming in. And if we could go on the headset about that. Council, council, it's uh, 245 anyway, so let's take our afternoon break. I'll stay here with the lawyers. We'll deal with this issue. It's going to take a little bit longer. It's time for our afternoon break. Um, we'll be in recess to about 320. That way we can deal with this and I can give the staff a break. Okay? I'll excuse the jury. I'll stay here with council. Please rise at the report.
All right, the jury is absent. Counsel and defendant are present. You can be seated. We excuse the jury so we could continue with this discussion of this issue uh, while the jury takes its break. I've got the citations. I don't need them. I'm, I'm familiar with the evidentiary issue. All right, um, and then defense counsel, have you had a chance to collaborate? We, we just we need to chat with our client a little bit and just have some further discussions. My understanding is that if some of it comes in, all of it comes in. Well, I, mean, I know you haven't ruled yet, but I'm I haven't picking ruled, that I haven't up. Ruled and I haven't, <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't ruled and I haven't read it, so I'm kind of uh, operating a little bit blind. But I think the basic point is if, if you're going to – the defense wants to offer statements that this witness – what was his name? Was this Ramon? Mm-hmm. Okay, Ramon. That Ramon uh, made to law enforcement supposedly as a witness in the case who was there. You're trying to show that Ramon made statements that are – inconsistent with the other evidence and that are false, correct? Correct. All right. And um, that the law enforcement agents uh, did not take that information and use it properly in evaluating the case. But if they're, but I understand from you and, and from the prosecutors, because you're familiar with what's, what's in the interview, and I'm not, that uh, in other places in this interview, Ramon makes statements that are incriminatory incriminating of the defendant that are consistent with the state's theory of the case with respect to the remaining charges, right? They could be. And, you know, from what I can know of, of what the evidence is, you know, it's if the defense is going to want to offer statements that the Ramon made to the law enforcement that were false or inconsistent or outright lies um, that are inconsistent with what they now know about the facts, it just seems in the, in, in an, in the interest of fairness, that the statements that he made that are consistent with the facts of the case and the theory of the case as is being presented would have to come in. I mean, it's uh, because that that is part and parcel of, of the evaluation. I think I think he testified that's part of the evaluation that the law enforcement officers made in terms of trying to uh, rely on his testimony. No, and I understand the court's position, and I think we're just going to take the time. Okay, I just want to make sure I understood the positions, and because I'm really kind of in the you know operating a little bit blind about what's in the statement. But is that? Cons- I just want to make sure I phrase the issue right, so I'm ruling correctly. Yes, that's the issue. Okay, Judge. you just want some time to talk to your client. Yes. Fair enough. All right, then we'll be in recess until about three twenty. If you need more time, let us know. Thank you, Judge. have a seat. The jury is absent. Counsel and defendant are present. Uh, Have you had, uh, Ms. Larkin, sufficient time to consult with co-counsel and with the client? Yes, Judge. I think an issue came up with the state that they wanted to address first. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Huerta, who was prior to, she's got to go to Tucson with her husband, who was involved in an officer shooting as they go to couple therapy, a wellness program. I can't. I can barely hear you. Are you talking? I'm sorry. The, yeah. I'll turn my little speaker up. All right. I'm sorry. Ms. Huerta, right. who was previously on the stand, she needs to testify today because she's going up to Tucson with her husband who was involved in an officer shooting, and they go as a couple, and they've got to plan therapy up in Tucson tomorrow. So if we can recall her and finish her, gives them more time to consider if they need more time, but allows us to finish her so she can accompany her husband tomorrow. Okay. Let's see. We're fine with that, Your Honor. All right, and did we straighten out the, uh, whatever the exhibit issue was? So are you good to go, Ms. Lothorpe? Uh, that, we, we recessed on that witness because there was some issue on discovery. Yes, and we've had a chance to talk, and I think uh, Brenna would like to just state the answer and, and have a request for the court. All right, but in terms of uh, Ms. Huerta, oh. you're good to go. Oh, I found the page, yes. Right, so you don't have any objection to that? <laughs> no, okay. I don't. All right, and so well, hold on a second. Let's find out what the other thing is. And, Judge, we did consult over the break. We talked with our client and reviewed this transcript again. And we are going to go ahead and pursue this line of questioning. We would just ask that the court um, provide the appropriate limiting instruction because it does have to be offered for a non-hearsay purpose. Okay. Um, And limiting instruction being that mean when the state or when when uh, when the statement is played in its entirety, that it's not offered for the truth of the matter, sir. Correct. Just to explain why the agents made the decision that they did. Yes. 
Something along those lines. All right. So this is about a one-hour recording. I think, Your Honor, I'm not 100% sure. If you want me to check, I can check. Well, I mean, more or less, more or less. Uh, I think it's about an hour, if I'm, but I haven't played it in a while, so that's just my recollection. And um, it's in Spanish? Yes, Judge, but we have it synced with the English translation. With a certif- translated by the certified interpreter. Certified by the certified tra- translator. And we have the paper translation with the certification attached hmm. that we can provide as well Okay. for the court. All right, so um, we'll take, what's your name, Ms. Huerta? Ms. That's correct. Huerta? All right, so we can, bring, we can bring her in. We'll call in the jury, and uh, we'll finish her testimony. We'll see how long that takes. Oh, she's right there. And then we'll recall uh, Detective Barba. Sound good? Yes, thank you. Okay, we're bringing the jury. Ms. Huerta here? Yes, sir. Okay. She, I'm not sure where Mr. Jetty went, but the witness is here. We can go without but Mr. Jetty. I think he just went to get the witness, maybe. The witness is right here, so I'm oh, not sure went. where he went. He's waiting for the jury, Your Honor. Oh, I can't see her. She, she's hiding behind KVOA or KOLD or K whatever. <laughs> Be seated. The record show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and the defendant. And okay, so this is um, Ms. Huerta. As you may recall, before lunch, um, she was testifying. We had a little um, confusion about some documents and some pages of an exhibit. That's been resolved. We're recalling this witness, trying to finish her testimony. She's got a family situation that recalls that uh, requires her to uh, to get this done as soon as possible. So we're going to accommodate that. And um, you're still under oath? Okay? Yes. All right. And we were doing cross-examination by Ms. Lothorp. So we're going to finish the examination of this witness, and then we'll recall Detective Barba. Whenever you're ready, Ms. Lothorp. Thank you, Judge. Um, good, good afternoon again. Um, I'm going to approach you uh, with the defense JJJ. And it was my bad, but... One page slipped off, and it's been located, and now let's let you look at it, okay? Have you had a chance to look at it? Yes. Did I fix the problem? Yes. That was good observation. Thank you for finding that. Okay, so I'm letting you hold on to the piece of evidence so you could refresh your memory with anything that I might direct you to, okay? Okay. So let's just go back. This is called a call detail report, and there's three different clumps of information or clumps of time that's being reflected in this one piece of evidence, correct? Yes. Okay. And so why don't you just, for the sake of letting everyone understand this, is what time periods or dates and what page numbers correlate with that? Could you go ahead and start just the way it's been stapled and um, go ahead and explain that? The first call card is from January 31st, 2023. That is after the incident date. 
but related to this crime, correct? Yes. Okay. And does it also go through February 1st? Yes. Okay. And how many pages are in this these call sheets? Does so five seem right? On this call report for the 31st, yes, there's five. Okay. And then we'll just let's just go through with the rest of the answers. So the next set of call reports are what dates? It's January 30th, 2023. And what's the first time that this report starts on this particular section? The timestamp is 1440 hours, military time. Yes. Okay. And so it's that would be 240 or whatever time in minutes, right? Yes. Okay. And how many pages are in this grouping? Four. Okay. And these page numbers are at the top on the right corner reflecting that, right? Yes. And then the third set. And what are we looking at there? What's the dates? It's January 30th, 2023. And the first time that it starts with? It's 1756 hours. And what is that in regular time? Um, 557? Yes. 556 in seconds. Okay. And how many pages are in this report? Eight. Okay. Now, before we try to get this entered, what are, what is this? What is a call detail report, and I called it call sheets. What is it? It's a printout of the call screen on our CAD. It's what we open up whenever there's an incident or a call. Um, it documents the time that it was opened up, the address, the caller information, and it timestamps all the radio logs that are entered by a dispatcher. Okay, so if there's information that's relayed, would that information possibly be in that report? Like be on the lookout for a tall male wearing blue shirt, right? That would possibly be relayed in the call sheet? Possibly. Okay. Is it up to the call taker to send that information out to patrol? Not necessarily. Okay. How does patrol get it then? It doesn't have to be the call taker. It could be another dispatcher handling the radio traffic. Okay. And that, okay. So that's not necessarily always the person on the phone that takes the call, but the people that assist with the call. Would that be a fair way to wrap it up? Yes. Okay. And we talked about that a little bit earlier, right? Yes. Okay. And if it's related to this call, it gets documented into this report for this incident, correct? Yes. If you had five different calls going on at one time of things happening, um, do you all keep them separate? Do you try to keep them separate? Different, as in different incidents or different calls regarding the same incident? Well, I think I know the answer to the second half of that is if the call is to that same incident, it would be in this call sheet and we would find it in the report, correct? Yes. Okay. But if they were different, if there was a burglary and a stolen purse at two different direct, uh, locations around town, that would have been under a different incident, correct? Yes. Okay. So you all have a, a means of not um, you know, getting them mixed up, so to speak, correct? So we have a means of not getting well, them mixed up? Well, if you are the call taker and someone else adds and dispatches something, they know how to get that information into your, ultimately your report of the person you're taking the call from. Yes. Okay. So there's a way to separate the calls. That's all I'm trying to say here. Yes. Okay. And this is computer generated, correct? Yes. So you can't alter it in any way. Right? If you enter it in or, you, or if it comes in 
uh, or if someone's dispatched, um, all this would be entered into this computer and then it can print out later uh, what we would call a call detail report or a call sheet, correct? Yes. Okay. And this is something like you um, coming in with the 911 tape. You um, also um, are familiar with this, this type of printout, aren't you? The call sheet printout? Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. And so at this time, let, I'd like to enter into evidence defense JJJ. Your Honor, I, I have to object based on hearsay because I think without the calls that go with it, this is misleading. And so my objection is hearsay. I see the exhibit. Yes. Without the calls that go with it? Correct. There are phone calls that were made to dispatch from Border Patrol. And these, there are details in the call report from those phone calls. And without those calls, um, the report itself is actually misleading. The call sheet is never with those calls in it, Judge. That's what 911 tapes and video audio things are for. This is the tracking of all the calls, the dispatching, and information they've received at accurate times generated by a computer. And she's a, a custodian of that. Well, the record is what it is, um, Exhibit JJJ, um, I'm looking at Rule 803, Exceptions to the Rule Against Hearsay, Subsection 6, Records of a Regularly Conducted Activity. Um, I think it meets the qualifications for 803.6. Your Honor, the problem is that contained in it, in the comments, I, I know you're looking at the top part where the calls are with the times. It's just the comments below detail the phone calls. And the phone calls, and they're specifically subject to one of the other arguments we just made with respect to a witness. Um, we've had some argument about a specific witness, and there are details in here about those calls. They're no longer those are, an argument. Let, let those are all hearsay. But I mean, they're, they're just, is, this, is this a record? It's that a record, we, just, on, but is it is this a record that was generated just for purposes of our testimony, or is this a record that's used in the regular course of business of the sheriff's department in the regularly conducted activity? Regular course of the sheriff's department, Your Honor. But these com the comments section are the the part that are concerning because we don't have the actual calls that go along with them, and they're misleading to the jury without the actual calls that go along with them. That's the concern but, the state but has. But it's still a record that they rely upon. If it meets the qualification, the reason I'm looking at 8036 is if it meets the qualifications for an exception of the hearsay rule, and those qualifications are that this is a record that's generated in the usual course of the sheriff's office practice, is used by them, and relied upon by them, and it was a regular part of their activity to make this report, then if the record is, if the particular document is, incomplete or unreliable for some other reason, it doesn't change the fact that they're still using it and relying upon it. Right? Then, Your Honor, I guess it's a 403 argument that it's more prejudicial than probative without the actual calls that go with it. Uh, I the, mean, the the counsel is essentially trying to get around the court's ruling on another issue by putting this in this way. And the comments that you're referring to are what, on the last page? Or? They, they all, each of the call reports, call detail reports, have a section called comments which is just a summary that the dispatcher writes in based on their phone calls, but the actual recordings are, are also available and have been disclosed. Right. The objections overruled. Exhibit JJJ is admitted. Want, you want this back before the witness? In front of the witness, please, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I know jurors heard a lot of that, and so I just want to solidify that for them to understand what they think might have heard they may understand it but everything that happens through the call center is that a proper word for your department do you use that word call center mm -hmm. okay and and for the court reporter she likes yes or no's not uh -huh. yes. she can't interpret it Sorry. okay yes. yeah we're helping her out thank you and so Everything has to be as accurate as possible, documented and generated through these computers that help mark the times and the, the things that you do on any one of the cases, correct? Yes. 
And although there could be a 911 tape if there was a caller through 911 or through a non-emergency number, whatever, that's a separate recording and thing that doesn't tie into this report, does it? Can you explain your question? If, if someone called for an, a non-emergency, it wouldn't be like stapled to this report, would it? You would just document the information and then it would be generated and kept permanent in this computer, correct? Yes. And I'm trying to simplify this as much as possible. I'm sure you could probably explain it better. But it's a very accurate system and the integrity of it is also important to you, right? Yes. I mean, you want to generate accurate, truthful information as you hear it, right? Yes. And that's how you're trained. Yes. All right. So let's come back to the first grouping, which is one through five. We'll come back to that since it's actually the day after. And let's focus. Does anybody, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but does anybody have an extra copy of this for the court? Judge, I think you should take a look at it. Can well, I, that's why I, I'm asking for it. Yeah, um, I think we may have it in evidence. If I could have a few minutes, it'll take me a minute to find it. But I, I have a copy that's with the clerk. <laughs> Well, we can, we can make, a, what is it, five pages? If it's faster, we can just make it. Faster. Actually, the, the whole thing has a few more pages. Than, that's just the first one. They're all stapled together. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is it this whole thing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can go ahead. Okay. So I don't know what order. If mine's been printed from the order that we received, it could be your order, Judge. But I'm going to jump over page one through five in the first grouping. That shows down. If you skim down, it starts with January 31st. I'm going to come back to that. I'm not sure which one you're on, Council. I'm, I'm sorry. You have them all together. Can you explain to me which one you're on and what page? I'm going to start at the earliest hour that the incident happened, which was at the 2 o'clock hour. Well, my, my pa the pages of the thing that Ms. Hunley just gave me are bait stamped. Do you have the same thing? Yes, I'm going to start at 55. That's, that's better. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're, and what the judge just said is there's a blue stamp here in the very, very bottom in the center. So just so we're all on the same page, we're going to go to 55, okay? Okay. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And in this, um, you stated earlier um, that your, um, the initial call that made contact, however you got it, what was the time on it? The call card is 1440 hours. Okay, and so that's 2.40, correct, in the afternoon? Correct. Okay. And does, does your report reflect how you got contact? I mean, was it a 911 call or something different? It was not a 911 call. Okay. And you could tell by looking at this and what do you see that tells you it wasn't? Um, there's a part on the call card that says how received. Okay. It says Tia's and Tom, which on the CAD, it says telephone. Okay. So you got a telephone call on this. And then um, we got a lot of units down there and names of people. Is that dispatched to or informed or how does that work? It lists the dispatcher to the left. And in the middle, it says unit. That's the deputy or okay. any officer responding. So we got a bunch of numbers like 130, 144, 191, 195. One, um, that should be it, right? Then it becomes duplicative. Maybe 121. Is that correct? Yes. 
some of the officers that somehow got dispatched or communicated to, correct? Yes. Now, do they have to acknowledge that they're, they're taking this call and let you know that? Yes. And then that's how you can place them out on this call, correct? Yes. Okay. And so you got a busy station. I can imagine this job is pretty chaotic. Would you agree? Yes. Especially when you have a bunch of calls coming in and things going on. Yes. Okay. And um, so I also noticed down there on the right, you have like in route to a call, and you start making note of that. That's the description um, category, correct? At which time? I'm just starting at the top, the uh, halfway down the page. And it says, sheriffs, it says in route to a call, call, and then it says equals 27 M's. For, is that what? Minutes? What is the M? 27M is the way the CAD categorizes a call. Okay. This is, this is an admitted into evidence, and unless and until the court changes its mind, which I haven't done yet, do you want to display this to the jury and have them follow? I can do that, Judge. I mean, it's, it's pretty detailed. I think it might hold their interest a little bit more and make okay. it more meaningful to them. If you don't want to do it, then don't do it. But Yeah, I'll try to see if I could do it on Elmo and read it at the same time. All clear now? <laughs> All, right. All right. You can go. Okay. Does that work for you? Ms. Lothorpe, you going to be able it to do it? It works, Judge. Thank you very All much right. for the suggestion. Let's go. Okay. So we can see at the top the nature of it. We can see the word homicide on there, correct? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Does that get assigned later as to the nature of the call? Yes. So it's not determined in the beginning there was a homicide, right? Because you don't know. Correct. Matter of fact, on the first call, you had no idea there was never a body found on this first call at this time. Isn't that correct? Um, according to the call card, that's correct. Well, remember, we, we got three sets of times. And in the order of my packet, I went to the second one, which mm -hmm. starts at 247. Correct? Correct. Okay. And so you can see the times uh, running down here. I'm pointing to the board if you're not following me for the jurors. And so those are the different times. Some event or something happens on the call, correct? Can you repeat the question? Yes. These times here, as you go down, some event, something happens to trigger a new time and then a description to the event, correct? Correct. So if you dispatch someone or someone calls and says, send me on that call, it would be noted on this form, correct? Correct. Okay. But at the top where I was pointing to homicide, the very top where it says nature and then it says homicide, that's something later you had to figure out, right? Somehow someone told you to put in homicide in there? Correct. Who would that have been? I don't recall. Okay, what kind of leadership would it normally be in order to get that information to make a note on the file? It depends. It could be the case officer, um, a detective on scene, or someone relaying um, the information to dispatch that's not necessarily the case officer. Okay, it's a big determination to note homicide, so that probably came from one of the supervisors or detectives. Would that be fair to, to estimate? I don't recall if it came from a supervisor or a detective. Okay. And then it does show here, and I'm going to step aside a little bit here, where it says complaint. That's what you were talking about. U.S. Border Patrol, Magalas Sector um, is the complainant, meaning they're the ones that referred the call in, correct? Yes, they are the caller. Okay. So this didn't come from the Cali home directly. We know why. Uh, we've heard testimony. But this came from some agent. Does it tell you what the name of that agent, Border Patrol agent, was? It does not. Okay. So you have no idea how you got it. Just the person. Ob objection, Your Honor. Um, this witness is testifying to the call card. Um, she also has her own personal knowledge. So I'm not 
sure what question counsel is asking. Is she asking on the call card, is, or is she asking of the witness's personal knowledge? Well, I hope and assume she's asking about just to interpret the information on the call card. Is that correct? Yes. I All am. right. So uh, the questions are directed. This is a witness who's qualified to talk about this document. She's familiar with it. It's generated as part of their usual course of business and in her work. And so she's testifying about what this entries mean on this call card. And it's admitted for that purpose. She was also a dispatcher that night, Your Honor. That's why I'm asking for clarification on what she's asking her. Well, I assume whatever she knows is based upon the calls that she received. Okay. Yes, and I guess if there's further questioning, the state will ask, I'm sure. But All right, you can go ahead. The objection's overruled. You can go ahead. Yeah, if you're confused to how you might know something, you want to bring clarity to it, feel free to mention, okay? Okay. Thank you. Okay. And... So you, we see down here on this column, we can see the different routes, the different people being dispatched, and then we have someone calling in to put CID on notice, on standby, correct? Place CID on standby, correct? Correct. correct. And we know that's a special department within the Sheriff's Department, right? Yes. And they cover homicides and, and very serious crimes in that department, correct? Yes. And how does your department put them on standby? We call the on-call detective if it's after hours, or we just call directly into their extensions if it's during business hours. Okay. There's some more updates as we go down on the very fall, far right under description. Border Patrol has units in the area, correct? Correct. And uh, we, we, there's a mention of the ravine and agents there and walking on the top, correct? Correct. Where's that coming from? That is a radio transmission coming from Sergeant Yuvia Garcia. Okay. And what's the message trying to tell you? The confirming the one about Border Patrol in the ravine. Okay. And then um, one of the sheriffs constant asked to contact the homeowner, see if the, what's a 1012? A subject. If the subject has returned while we have been looking. So is the subject Mr. Kelly or is the subject the person that might have shot or ran on the property, the Ms. trespassers. Objection Ms. form of the question. Do you know which Compound. one it is? No, no, overruled. Do you know which one it is? Mr. Kelly. Okay. So you have him as subject already, correct? Yes. Not homeowner, but subject, correct? Yes. So why, just curious, and if you know, you know, you don't, you don't. But why isn't the subject the people that ran by with guns in front of the, the, the Kelly's residence in front of their window. Why aren't they the subjects? We use codes in dispatch to try to minimize airtime. Okay, that's good. So 1012 could mean, um, in this case, it's Kelly. Um, but that's why it says 1012 and not Kelly. We use a lot of codes. Why? What's the code for complaining? The person complaining of the issue out in their own. RP. Okay. That's the reporting person. Yes, RP is used for when they are the caller. Right, but that wasn't the case here. We have Border Patrol intercepted a call. So what would you call, what would be another word for calling the complaint? Not the one that made the call, but the complaint. Well, we know the complainant was Border Patrol, so we call them 865. It's another code. We have a bunch of uh, people arriving on the scene. And then, what does C4 mean? Code 4 means okay. Means what? Okay. Okay? Yes. And what does that mean to all officers or to you? 
that the situation is okay. Okay. And then what is this next to it? C4 Coyote. They are, they're asking for the location and I believe that might be Calle Coyote. They just put Coyote. What does that mean? It's a street name. Street name? Yes. What does Coyote Street have anything to do with this case? I'm not too sure. Is there anyone dispatched to a street named Coyote in this place? No. Could Coyote mean something different? Negative. Okay. Incident will be documented for report purposes. Okay, so no, no one was found on the property. Would that be fair? No trespassers were arrested, correct? Correct. So no incident report is being made, just an information report to document this call, correct? Correct. And no coyotes were, were, were arrested, right? No, can I clarify on that? Sure. Looking at the times, that was Deputy, well now it's Corporal Muskies. He was en route at 1529. I believe during that time frame, they did locate Mr. Kelly and they started to give um, code 20s, which is uh, security checks, like where's your location? And I do believe he was still attached to the call card that they gave him a welfare check and he advised he was okay. And they just put Coyote, but it's Calle Coyote in Rio Rico, Arizona. What is this on the um, last entry? It says, you know, the sheriff's office, plus 10 to 12 in the area. If you look at the previous one entered by Deputy Castaneda at 1627, right after the SCSO, it's MDC in parentheses. That means that the deputy entered that radio log. And the plus sign just means that it's a runoff on a radio log entry. What's the purpose of the comment section? The comment section documents everything, correction, documents a summary of the call, of any calls coming in pertaining to that incident. So if an officer gets on there and does some explanation, you could document it in this section? Can you clarify that question? Do you come up with what's said or is some of it a contribution from officers? On the comments, the officers also have access to enter their own comments. Okay. And it says U.S. Border Patrol call and advise of a possible active shooter in the area of 100 East Sage Brush Road. U.S. Border Patrol advised that the reporting person was unsure if he was getting shot as well. So that would be Border Patrol, right? Correct. And Jeremy Marcel was not the person that you guys heard from, was it? Correct. Okay. So someone else in his department made the phone calls. Is that your understanding? Correct. Okay. And so that person that was reporting it had limited information and didn't have all the facts. Does that seem fair based on this narrative? Correct. And then they said Border Patrol advised that the reporting person's name is Alan Kelly. But it's not really the reporting person as you know it. It is the person or the complainant that's originating the call when they contacted Border Patrol. Is that your understanding? Correct. Okay, we're using that word in more than one person, so I just want to bring clarity to that. At 1436 hours is when the reporting person advised he thought the group of people that were running shooting at him. So he reported a phone, a, a shots fired somehow, and it's being conveyed to 
uh, Mr. Marcel, Jeremy Marcel, Border Patrol agent, and given to however many Border Patrol agents that finally reported it to you made this call, correct? Correct. And then we had a change of address. Is that what 1447 was? Correct. And then you heard from Border Patrol that a couple of their agents were coming and responding. Is that right? Correct. And so far it says negative with the reporting person. I think they're meaning Mr. Kelly now, right? Correct. So they, they haven't heard from him? Is that what that's saying? That they didn't have contact number to the reporting person at that time, correct? Correct. Because it went through a middle person, or two, or three, correct? Unknown amount of people made contact since Mr. Kelly made the original call. Objection, Your Honor. Foundation? Do you know? Sustain. Okay. Um, someone called um, Mrs. Kelly, right? And we get information, once again, of five on the property caller buys. Alan is trying to chase them south of the property with large backpacks, possibly undocumented foreign nationals. And he's armed with a rifle as well as one of the group of five. As well as one of the group of five might have a rifle too, correct? That's what the call card states, correct? So that came from Mrs. Kelly? Or that came through an officer that supposedly got a hold of Mrs. Kelly, correct? Correct? I do the not recall. The officer made this, report, this, this narrative, this comment, correct? Which one? The one I just oh. read about the... No, about this was taken by Javier Tintos. He was in training. That's why it says Rookie 4. I'm oh, sorry. So 865 is Border Patrol. So Border Patrol called advising that they made contact with a spouse and they had yet to locate... Or correction, and they just relayed what the spouse had said. Okay, and the last line says, and what time would that be? Sixteen twenty-seven. Right, and incident will be documented for informational purposes, negative with any 10, 12s, again, what was that? Subject. So now the subjects are the other people that might have been on the property, correct? Correct. Okay. Let's move to, through that report, which had four pages, and go to the next one, which at the bottom is number 59. The timestamp on the call card is 1756 hours. Okay, and I'm pointing to where the, where you see the earliest time. Is that an accurate point? It'll be the timestamp underneath the supplement. Okay, where is that at? On the top. Okay, and so up there at the very top. Yes. I can't reach that. Okay, so how are you able, as dis working in dispatch, uh, working at the call center, how are you able to take this new call and tie it to the other one? Because the other one kind of ended when everything seemed to check out okay. And so that call completed. How are you able to, in your job task, able to connect this so that we could see it in court today? I'm sorry. You're asking how I tie in supplement calls? So you, you, you do know that the last call, that we, the last sheets that we were looking at said, that just document this. Susan, let's do that. It said document it, right? And that it was all is okay. 
And so that ended that that series of stuff that happened. That was at four o'clock, the four o'clock hour, whatever time it was. Correct. Correct. Okay. My question is, you got another call now that's related, possibly to the same homeowner or something, the same incident. How are you able to connect that and allow us to see all of this? Is it by you run it by address? How do you find out? Normally, the officer will advise you, um, supplement for report number, and then they'll give you the report number, um, and that's documented on the call comments. In this case, it occurred within the same time frame, or it wasn't until the next day. Normally, supplemental call cards are usually opened days later or maybe the next day of the incident. So you could find it easily. <coughs> yes. Okay. And is it true, is this, this Sheriff's Department procedure, when after a call, do they ask for a report number from you guys? It depends if the officer will document the incident. Okay. That's when they ask for a report number. So in the last in's calls, was that even documented to create a report number at that point in time? The first call? The one we just talked about. Yes, yes, they asked for a report number to document the incident. All right, so they wanted to document it. The, you generated a report number, and so it would be easily to refer this as a supplement to that with anyone that might have responded earlier. Correct. And then you tie it together. Correct. Okay, thank you for that information. All right, let's talk about some of the stuff that's on here. We're going to go back to the description column here and look at some of them. And on the left, though, we do have different officer names, or the dispatcher, and then we have the different officers by their numbers, correct? And then descriptions over on the right. Is that right? Am I still there? Same type of form? Correct. Okay. you got a bunch of people calling, saying they're going, they're in route, things like that. Then we have an officer here. Uh, saying walking east from the 42. And what's 42? Residence. Okay. And then you had another one that says confirmed 450. What does that mean? Dead body or okay. deceased person. And, four, and what's 450 mean? That means body, dead body? Yes. Okay. And dead body does have blood, possible some sort of unknown injury, 100 yards or less from the, for, from the 42, and that's the house, correct? Correct. And get a, what's the rest of that? On the bottom, the plus sign, that just indicates that it's a runoff of the same transmission. And where, do, where does the rest go? It says get a hold of CID. Okay. Oh, I see. So it drops down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's the get and and then the plus to add it hold of CID. Um, call graveyard in early. That's for backup purposes, right? For shift coverage, yes. Yes. So if a lot of people are going to be tied to a murder scene, you want that next shift maybe to get in early so that the streets are still covered. Correct. Correct. Is that a possibility? Correct. You're not the one that requested that. You just no. did what you were told. Correct. Okay. And then how does everyone, once again, get communicated to get into the office, or get into the station early? I don't recall in this incident if dispatch assisted or if it was the sergeant that called the graveyard units to come in early. Okay. And then we have 630. In 23 seconds, bodies laying face down is not pulse, not breathing, sort of warm, has not acclimated the plus and the TED in the next line to temperature. This is a recent. What's that word? You're you're off the screen now. So. Oh, thank you, Judge. There you go. Right there you go. Thank you. So I was, this is not, and what's this word? Don't. This is a recent, don't let the 10 to 12 go back inside. What is that? 
It says don't let the 1012 go back inside the 42 anymore. Is that the home? Yes. And the 1012 would be the Kellys? Correct. And that was at 1831, correct? Correct. 1830. <coughs> and I'm showing no. it seems it, like a continuation of information, correct? No. No? Tell me where it stops. 1830 is the last, it's a different transmission that ends at recent. 1831 with 46 seconds, that's a whole new radio transmission. Okay. Do you have any idea who's, who said that last transmission? It was Sergeant Omar Gar Rodriguez. Thank you. It's 6.30. correct? PM. Um, advise him it's a criminal investigation. Is that what that stands for? Correct. Okay, I put it together. And that there's a couple of canines out there. They've disturbed part of the scene. However, the one, however the one, what does that mean? It should be 1012. It just continues on to the. Thank you. Okay, however, the 1012 and canines disturb the scene. Now we have at 636, we have injury wound backside of the torso, right side, correct? Correct. And I believe mine is not the evidence, so I'm just putting a little dash here, just a second, Your Honor. time Sergeant Flores arrived at this scene? Can you look at this and tell me? The call card states he arrived at 1925. Okay, so he, according to that, which this is accurate information, correct? That, that would be later after the, the, um, the note that I made at about 1836 um, that the injury wound backside of the torso right side and he's not even there yet, is he? Crime scene is not there yet, correct? The criminal investigation division is not there yet, no. Thank you for that information. And so we have... According to this, we have information of a backside of the torso right side, a wound that's being reported by O. Rodriguez, correct? Correct. All right, what does this one here mean? Check with 865, see if they have cameras. Is that supposed to be pointing towards the direction of the 42? So you're, at, you're trying to, someone's asking for you to inquire with Border Patrol and see if there's any cameras out there. Is that about right? Correct. Thank you. And it says here, um, anything helping investigation, 451 involving a possible undocumented alien, right? And 451 again is what? That one means, I'm not too sure if it, what the dispatcher was trying to put, but 451 is, I don't know what that is. I know maybe it might have been 450. And if it was 450, what would that say? It'd be for deceased person. Or a dead okay. body. Okay. Makes a little more sense, right? Correct. Okay. And then the, res the response back about the cameras comes here. 
1842, cameras not fixed in any direction. They didn't see him leave the 42, which is the house, right? Correct. They weren't, uh, and looking at the area, correct? Correct. So someone at Border Patrol surveillance says, we weren't even focused in that area at the time. Is that about what I'm reading? Correct. And if I'm wrong, correct me, please. And then confirming 10 to 12 called 865. What's 865? Border Patrol. Called Border Patrol and told them he shot something. Check with E65. Who's E65? It, it's 865. Nogales Border Patrol. It's an, a Border Patrol. So Border Patrol, someone in Border Patrol, and you said Jeremy was the person you were, uh, Marcellus was not the person that you were talking to, but someone else in Border Patrol, all of a sudden you guys hear some emission about shooting at this person, right? And you dispatch that, don't you? That he told them he shot something, right? That's uh, Sergeant Omar Rodriguez. That's his radio transmission. So who's saying this? Omar Rodriguez? Yes. Or you guys telling me? No, this is Omar Rodriguez. This is his radio transmission. Confirming 1012 called 865 and told him he shot at something with, check with 865. So the radio transmission might be more formal, forming sentences. Our radio transmissions don't have to be. They just have to make sense. Um, to someone like you that knows how to interpret this. And the deputies, correct. Right. And so here you are interpreting it. How correct. do you interpret it for these jurors? Correct. So this is coming from Sergeant Rodriguez. And what is he trying to say? That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, only writing on my copy, okay? This is so confusing. And then we have coordinates copying, right? Correct. Someone called it in and gave the coordinates to the body? Yes, on the left, it's 150, which is Sergeant Omar Rodriguez. Okay. Was advised and stated, get info for 136. 1012 behavior is extremely suspect and knows a lot of info about what's going on and is being hesitant and saying someone else maybe shot him. This came from O. Rodriguez, I suspect. Is that correct? Correct. What's for 136? What does that mean? Get info for 136. That will be Detective Ainsa, Jorge Ainsa. That's his badge number. And 1012 behavior is the suspect. And extremely is suspicious, a good word for that, S-U-S. Correct. And knows a lot info about what's going on. Um, so we got some in route, and then we have 1012 was cold to touch and extremities two, two meaning also not breathing, no pulse, torso area was still warm to the touch, which tells me it is recent, correct? Correct. So you were attempting to contact 114? What's that? That will be Deputy Chief Gerardo Castillo, as number 114. Okay, so we're going up to, is that a sheriff supervisor? It's the um, 
it's the sheriff and then it's the chief deputy. Okay, so he's a higher ranking correct. officer of the sheriff's department, correct? Correct. And try calling him R9, what's that? That is <laughs> evidence custodian Luis Gonzalez. His badge number is R9. Was called in to assist with lightning. Made contact with 114. And then it says, what's the rest say? Hell call you, what am I reading? Uh, made contact with 114, he'll call you RN, which is right now. Right now, okay. So no abbreviations, so that's a he'll call you. Okay, thank you. And then someone arrived on the scene. You're off the screen again. Thank you, Judge. Then it says, Wanda Kelly, George Kelly, D4103. What's that mean? Um, that's, we have districts. District 4 is the Nogales area, and 103 is headquarters. So that's our Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office in Nogales. And then what is the, why is Wanda and George's name ne near that? Is that, why is their name written here? I do not recall the recording, what exact transmission was given for that time. Okay. Separate entry? Correct. Exit, let's see, exit 42101 with us in unit. What is that? Um, exiting residence, female subject with us in unit. Female subject is in the unit. Is that, would that be Mrs. Kelly? Correct. Does it show Mr. Kelly in a unit yet or not yet? I do not see it on this page. Okay, let's turn the page. The bottom will be reflected as 61. All right, I think we're going to take our evening recess. Um, it's about 425. I want to talk to the jurors a little bit, and I like to recess at 430. Um, Thank you. Uh, you can step down. Your Honor, with the court's permission, could we recall this witness on, thir on Thursday? Right. Yes, yes. I mean, she, you've got to get up to Tuesday. Right? Right. Thursday morning? Tomorrow. That's what, tomorrow? Yeah. Oh, what day is today? It's Wednesday. Wednesday. I guess that would be Friday, Judge. Can we recall her on Friday? She's got to be in Tucson tomorrow. She's got to be in Tucson tomorrow. Yes. Any objection? Uh, Friday morning. Oops, sorry, Judge. Friday morning, okay. 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 All right, thank you. You're excused. Thank you. We'll see you Friday morning then. Okay. Um, let's see. These are, what are these, exhibits? They are, Judge. I'm going to give these back to the, well, I'll, we'll give them back to the clerk. I'll need them later. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about Thursday, tomorrow. <clears throat> Again, we're going to have court 8.30 tomorrow morning. We'll continue with testimony and witnesses. Then we'll break for lunch. Then you'll come back at about 1 or 1.30. We'll see, where, we'll see what time we break. What will happen then is, uh, as I said, we're going to take what everyone's calling a field trip. Um, <laughs> but it's not going to be like the field trip you took when you were kids, or I took, <laughs> at least I took when I was kids. You're going to go out to the Kelly Ranch, and here's how it's going to work. We have a van. All the jurors are going to be taking the van. Someone from our court administration is going to drive the jurors out there. Uh, we'll have some court staff. The lawyers will be out there separately. The lawyers have uh, been working on this. This is a, a joint request from the lawyers that, that we do this. And we've been working on it. Um, and they've come up with an agreement about what you're going to see. And we'll go over that uh, more tomorrow. But uh, just in preparation for tomorrow, you're going to be out there on the scene. Um, I checked the weather forecast. It's supposed to warm up, um, get kind of warm. You might want to look at it yourself so you know what to wear. Obviously, you're going to go out there, and part of it we're going to drive around, but part of it is going to be some walking, all right? No one's going to have to walk multiple football fields, I don't think, but if it, we're going to make it as accommodating for you as possible. But you'll be taken around, and you'll, there'll be designated locations of things you're going to see. So, for example, um, you'll see the driveway. You're going to go into the Kelly residence, in the kitchen, in the living room, in the hallway, in the bedroom, on the patio. You know, 
the locations that have been the subject of a great deal of evidence and testimony in this case. Anyway, be prepared for that. Uh, dress appropriately, sunscreen, hats. We're going to try and have some cold bottled water for you uh, because it's going to be warm. Um, so be prepared for that. And, I, um, and again, we're going to go into more detail tomorrow when it's closer to the time when we're going to do this. And I'll talk to you about I have some very strict rules that are going to have to be followed, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. But in the meantime, uh, be prepared for that tomorrow. There'll be some walking, dress appropriately. You know, it's going to be warm and hot, uh, which is better than cold and windy as far as I'm concerned. And you'll go and do that. And um, if possible, also, I think the last site that we'll visit is um, a section of the border where the wall is that has been discussed in this case. And for that, we're going to drive you there. So you're not going to walk there. It's too far. I just want to be aware of what we're going to do so you can prepare yourself, dress appropriately, and, uh, and be prepared for that, comfortable shoes. I anticipate that will consume the afternoon. And when that's all over, we're going to bring you back, and we're just going to recess for the afternoon. And then you'll come back Friday morning, and we'll continue with the testimony. OK? Uh, again, it's really just to help prepare you so you know what to expect, and, and you dress appropriately and with proper shoes and so forth. Does anyone, there will be some walking uh, involved. Does anyone, and we're going to try and keep it to a minimum, but you know what's out there. And um, the terrain is such that you're going to have to do some walking. Does anyone anticipate any problems with that? Anybody have any issues with that? No. All right. Uh, juror number four, the clerk's brought to my attention uh, your situation with your employer. I haven't talked to him since he talked to you again. My suggestion to him was that. I have a friendly conversation <laughs> with your employer, uh, but I don't want to do that unless that's all right with you. That's fine with me. I know <laughs> okay. Uh, friendly conversation, okay. Um, so I'll try and take care of that. Did you give him contact, the clerk contact information for this gentleman or person? Uh, I said that I'll reach out and figure out who to really contact in regards to that. Uh, unfortunately, I can't do that you know, right no, now. No, I don't want you to say anything. I just want, I'm just asking, I, I want, if I have to call somebody, I want to know who to call and how to get in touch with them. So that's my. Oh, we have that? Okay, we already have. All right, I, I, I guess they told me we already have that. I wasn't aware of that, so we're good. All right, but you're good with that. Good. Okay, any other questions about the schedule or what's going to happen tomorrow? All right, very well. Uh, you're excused for the evening. Remember the court's admonition. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 8.30 for more testimony. All right. I'll stay here just in case there's anything else. Okay, you can have a seat. Jury's, jury's absent. Counsel and the defendant are still present. Um, I want to keep the the I want to keep the people who go to the scene um, tomorrow in the afternoon to the absolute bare minimum of who's absolutely necessary. So let's just discuss that. Obviously, the state, two prosecutors, Detective Ainza. Hopefully, nobody else. Anybody else? Can't hear you. We had planned a detective from our office as well. Was it one or two? From, for, one what or per, two. for what purpose? What, what per one vehicle? Um, and I'm unclear if the victims have requested to attend, Your Honor. I think they would be entitled to be present if they want to be there. But I don't know what the latest conversation with them was about whether they intended to um, or come or not. And is that why the, you want the detectives to be there? Yes. All right, if the victims aren't going to attend, then we don't need the detectives, right? I suppose we could just come with Detective Ayn, So All right, sure. So if the, victims, if the victims' representatives wish to attend, they do have a right to be there, uh, and we'll make that accommodation. And if they're there, then the detectives can transport them. But if not, then they'll just be the three of you. Fair enough? Sure. That'd be fine, Your Honor. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, defense, obviously, to counsel. Defendant, I assume maybe Mrs. Kelly will be there. Anybody else? Uh, yes, um, we have her dad laying out the placards. Well, and I was going to ask also, about that. Yeah. yeah, so we also, he'll be out to make sure they're in place where they were put. 
but we also suggested to the state, we haven't heard a response yet, of him standing out in that location where the body was. Well, let's talk about the first thing first. I want to be sure that everything's in place so when we get out there, it's there, it's set up, you don't have to set anything up. We'll be leaving from court when you dismiss to verify that everything's still in place. No set. wind, no nothing has moved it. And it's set up with... It'll be set money. up before and it'll be numbered. So it should match the list, whatever printout everyone's going to get. Perfect. Perfect. Good. And your honor, the state's concerned that Mr. Larkin represents a party in this matter. He represents a witness and that just doesn't seem appropriate. Um, well, he's not going to talk to I don't know if a uh, court... Um, well, once deputy would like once to he do sets, it. Once, he's, once everything's set up, we don't need him there, right? It's the person who's standing at the location of the body oh, or standing yeah. at the location and of the... And we requested that he does wear just khaki color clothing for the purpose of illustrating. And he won't talk to anybody and he will be under the, you know, he's a officer of the court and he will follow those orders. And your honor, we had a dark brown backpack as well. Um, so I think that that's why when we created it, we had a black shirt on one of the detectives to well, sort of black shirt. have that color. But so I think we, it's getting a little complicated, but I think perhaps a, a court, um, a court officer might be more appropriate than if, an attorney for a party in this case. If they could have a choice of a detective isn't it not okay that we also get a choice of someone that we know will follow well, the rules? Well, I think what's important is that if we're, now we're talking about if the jury requests to see, you know, from some vantage points out to where, um, out to uh, where the Kellys say they saw what they saw, then the only thing that matters is that who's ever out there and performs that function has some rough resemblance to what actually was alleged, who actually was alleged to have been out there. Like the We're willing to put on whatever you want. I just told them to put on, you know, color coding to the terrain, the tans or whatever. I think he could probably come up with tan pants. If they have a backpack they want him to wear, we can put it on him too. We're open. I mean, if, if there's some, it doesn't matter who does it. It's just... It's Someone just, is just going to stand there and, and do what they're told to do. But we're just concerned that it's inappropriate for an attorney representing a, a well, witness make to do a, it. Somebody make an alternative suggestion then. I, I was suggesting court staff, Your Honor, but we're happy to have a detective do it. Um, I just don't think it's appropriate for an attorney who represents a witness to do it. Well, um, I, I'm not that concerned about it, but it's not. A, I'm not going to make a big issue out of it. But let's. What. Um, how big was the victim? Five? Um, five, nine. five, eight or so? I'm, yeah. Five, eight, five, nine, Judge, maybe? I, I'm not sure, Your Honor. We'll have to check the autopsy to be huh? certain. The detective's checking I now. Mean, you know, we're not okay. going to. Huh? And it's seven. probably at kilograms. Seven. We'll have to figure it out. <laughs> it's not in the autopsy. Check the autopsy. Well, it looked like he was about average height, like five, eight or so. And yeah. you know, I would say maybe. Average height, average weight. About 180 pounds or so. Yeah, that'd be my guess, Judge, from what I observed. You know, but I, I, I'm guessing. We're not going to call, you know, Madame Toussaint and have a wax figure. Made, but. So, all right, we'll see. Uh. <laughs> He's still little. Sorry. Yeah. He's no. Perfect. No. No. No, Ian. <laughs> no. <laughs> I like to give them And I think time. the bailiff would have to be in charge of the jury, so that probably wouldn't Right. So the other thing that's gonna, well, the other thing that's going to happen is uh, the, ba the bailiff and uh, Deputy Martinez, there you are. The Deputy Martinez are going to escort the jurors one through, just locations one through 14. Lawyers, court, everyone else, we're going to be off to the side, okay? You're not gonna, we're not going to follow them around from one, two, three to 14, okay? Not going to be any talking. There's not going to be any conversation. They're going to lead, the bailiff and the deputy are going to lead the jurors through the points of interest. The lawyers are going to be off to the side. We're going to be off to the side. Okay. Um, any problem with that? No, Your Honor. All right. I don't want, I don't want any talking. Uh, no one's going to be allowed to have any cell phones. I'm going to tell them to turn them all off and put them away. Um, so that's how they're going to be led around. Okay. Um, I don't want any contact with... Any of us, lawyers, court staff, anyone else with the jurors while they're going from A to B to C. Or the parties, correct, Your Honor? 
Well, yeah, like Mr. Questions? and Mrs. Kelly as right. well. Okay. Um, Mrs. Kelly is just going to be hidden in her bedroom, which will not be shown. And so she's not going to be out there to be seen at all. That's fine. Um, and then, um, you know, someone's going to have to provide some clothing that roughly assimilates what um, the victim was I wearing. like this, the clothing he's wearing. <laughs> Who? Martina? Yeah. Take off the anything shiny, and I'd be happy with it. Well, you folks work on that. I mean... Um, it, he was 5'6 and 186 pounds, Your Honor. Oh, that's pretty close. Well, shorter. Okay. All right. Can, can you put on like 80 pounds over in there? <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see. Uh, Your Honor, that happens to be the same height and weight about as Detective I don't, you know. I don't know. If we can't use ours, I, don't want, I want him <laughs> off to the side, too. I don't have an objection to that, Judge. I'm just... Suggest well, if it's not appropriate that Mr. Larkin does it, it's not appropriate that Detective Ainsley does it. Um, well, I'll just come up with somebody else, and we'll look around here. It doesn't okay. have to be. It's not going to be exact. But, and, and again, they might not ask for it, but I just I kind of think they will. So I want to be prepared. How about some clothing? Can we get together, what was it? Um, Beige tactical pants and an olive jacket and a dark brown woodland backpack. Well, pretty large. I don't think you can see a backpack from that distance. Well, but I think if the coloring if is, if you right. want to do it, all right. I am not going shopping tonight. Uh, I never go shopping. Um, so somebody come up with clothing. Be prepared for it. Um, it's your cases, and uh, we can try and find a neutral body. But um, in terms of clothing and appearance and stuff, that's I'm going to leave that up to you. All right. And if we can't do it, then we'll. And they want to do it, then we'll decide whether we just go with what we got. All right, Mr. Larkin, you ready to get everything set up tomorrow for us? We're on our way out here this afternoon. They're on their way out this afternoon. Excellent. All right, anything else? Good. All right, we'll see you at 8.30 tomorrow morning. We're adjourned for the evening. Thank you. Please rise and give a call.